Hello and welcome to episode number 233 of the Garment Show podcast. I am here with Dr. David Sinclair, author of Lifespan, a wonderful book I have just enjoyed reading, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To. It is specifically about aging. He is an expert in aging. Let me give a little bit of a biography here. Professor of the in the Department of Genetics and a co-director of the Paul F. Glenn Center for the Biology of Aging at Harvard Medical School. Co-director, he is in this. Uh, this is wonderful. How we age, how to slow its effects. PhD in molecular genetics at the University of New South Wales, Sydney. You are Australian. This is a wonderful thing. And the co-founder of so many companies in biotechnology. Uh, we had a past guest, Safi Bakal. He was also a pharmaceutical uh, representative. So this is a wonderful thing. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Armin. Thanks for having me on. This is wonderful. So I very much enjoyed your book. I like the way books are laid out. You have the past, the present, the future. Um, I like the subsections in books because I take notes based on the subsection. So it's a nice organization you had there. What I always like to check first, what about your personality got you into this field in the first place, if it comes to mind? Uh, my personality. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm of the belief that we humans can do better. Um, that we're destined to do better. And the 20th century was horrific. And my grandmother from a young age who, who raised me mm -hmm. uh, said that I need to see if we can make humanity better. And so I've spent my whole life trying to work on what I think is one of the biggest problems we face, and that is illness, especially as we get older. And I've wanted to, to understand why we age and what we could do to prevent diseases of old age. And I, I got my PhD um, and came to MIT with the express reason, uh, express uh, desire to uh, be hopefully one of the people that figured this out and made a big difference. Mm -hmm. This is a wonderful thing. I notice in the early chapter you discuss what aging is and eight or nine specific things that cause aging and that they come together to be a loss of information is the main issue. Can you speak a little bit about some of the eight or nine specific things that occur? Right. Uh, well, in in the 1990s, uh, we didn't know much about aging at all. And then in the 2000s, we realized that there are longevity genes in our bodies that respond to biological stress. So when we're hungry and we exercise, you turn on these defense pathways. Uh, and then about 10 years ago, the field settled on a number of what we call the hallmarks of aging, about eight or nine different causes, uh, misfolded proteins, telomere shortening, mitochondrial dysfunction, this kind of thing, stem cell loss, senescent cells. Um, and we declared victory. Uh, now we understand aging. But it's, I never felt like that was a satisfying explanation for aging. And I've always believed since we worked on little yeast cells at MIT that there is a unifying theory of why we age. And what I've um, put out in my book is the idea that aging is simply a loss of information over time. Uh, and what's remarkable about that idea is that we've recently discovered that there's a backup hard drive of that youthful information that we can access. Right. One thing I notice across the book, there's some certain themes. I, I like to notice the broader themes. One of them is it's sort of like, well, yes, aging as a disease, it's not looked at that way. So changing the dynamic in society of how it's looked at that's a key point that's represented there. Until it's looked at like a disease, it'll be looked at like time just passes and that's what occurs. It doesn't have the depth to it. And then another thing that comes to mind is, do you get the feeling often when you're working on your material that we're sort of in these unevolved bodies that have analog components and we have to get it as quickly as possible to the next steps because it just seems really slow? Well, yeah, I mean, we're, we're certainly not perfect uh, machines. We're, we're very good at staying alive for about 40 or 50 years in, in good health. Uh, but we, we are not designed or we're not, we didn't evolve to live longer than that because there was no need to. That was enough to get us, uh, you know, a partner and, uh, and produce enough offspring to ensure that our genes were passed on and uh, evolution has no interest in whether we pass on or not. Um, so we're, we're, we're not perfect organisms by any means. There are other organisms that live a lot longer than we do, um, even ones that are very similar to us and share 90% of our genome, like a whale, and they can live 200 plus years. And there are other organisms that live for thousands of years. So 
you know, we, we like to think we're at the top of evolution or the top of the food chain. Uh, we're, you know, we're certainly at the top of the food chain, but we weren't until recently. Um, and now that we've basically re removed a lot of death due to infection and, uh, and wars, what's left is aging. And this is our final medical frontier that I think we can, we can fix. And you asked about analog. So I, in the book, I propose that this information that we lose is analog information, which is very easy to lose. Mm -hmm. um, the genome is digital. The epigenome that regulates it is analog. Yeah, we, we're built as analog devices. We are imperfect. I mean, one day we may be digital beings and being able to download our brains into something digital. But until then, we need a, a medical fix. Uh, and that's what I'm working on. Mm -hmm. I noticed that a lot of your research and where you look at what the research is based on extreme conditions or adversity, uh, cold or hunger. It reminded me of one episode I had before with uh, Charles Cockle of University of Edinburgh. He studies extremophiles and or on Mars to find out uh, new ways to respond to the environment. In the same way, you spoke a bit about adversity, cold and or hunger. Can you speak to that and what it causes in the uh, response pathways that we have? Right. So this is part two of the book, uh, the, the genetic pathways that respond to adversity. They've, they're in all life. They're in bacteria. They're in the trees. They're in the food we eat. Um, they're in our pets. And they res they've evolved, uh, I propose in the book, that uh, it's a survival circuit that is very important to keep us healthy when we're young, but it actually comes back to bite us when we're older, when we're not needed. And what they serve to do is to keep the body alive when times are tough. So when we're hungry, that's a threat. When we're running, that's a per perceived threat. If we're eating food that's stressed, the plants that we eat, if they're stressed, we get a signal, we believe. Um, if you're really cold or really hot, um, and if you go from hot to really cold suddenly, these are all shocks to the body that turn on these pathways that keep us healthier for longer. And now we really understand why dieting and exercise are good for, for us. It's the turning on these survival systems. Now, the word for this is called, it's, it's hormesis. Hormesis is essentially anything that doesn't kill you will make you stronger and longer lived. And that's what, what I do with my life. I, I try to put myself in a state of hormesis, cycling through these uh, perceived adversities that don't really hurt my body, but they put my body in a state of high alert. Mm -hmm. One thing that comes to mind when you describe that is what would you say the difference is between that kind of stress that kicks in your um, response systems versus stress that leads to cortisol being released in the body? What's the difference there? Right. Uh, so, so the stress that I'm talking about is cellular stress, um, meaning the cells might be pushed uh, on temperature or on nutrient, um, not enough nutrients. Uh, but that's not the same as psychological stress. The, unfortunately, it's the same word, but they're completely different things. Psychological right. stress, obviously, is is like being a graduate student in my lab. And <laughs> that's not good for you in the long run. And cortisol is not good either. A little bit of stress, I find, um, as long as it's not c crippling and leading to physical decline, I think is helpful. I, I find myself doing a lot of things that I regard as uh, stressful, a lot of adrenaline, um, but not chronic stress. You've got to be able to um, calm down. And a lot of people use uh, sleep and meditation and yoga to be able to mitigate those negative effects. Mm -hmm. Now, in connection with stress and or stressors on the body, there is methylation and or acetylation on the DNA that shows a record of time, the Horvath clot. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit about that time aging yeah, representation? So the Horvath clock is one of the biggest discoveries in the aging field of all time. Um, Steve came at this question of aging separate from me, but we've come to the same conclusion. Now, what Steve discovered, and, and some other scientists, but he gets, the, gets to name it, the Horvath clock, what it is, it's, it's chemical changes that occur on the DNA called methylation. And these methylation marks, normally what they do is they tell a cell what, they sh what a cell should do. So if if you've got a certain number of methylation marks, you'll be a nerve cell, and if you have different ones, you'll be a skin cell. We call this the epi ep epigenetic marks. And without them, cells lose their identity, they become dysfunctional, and eventually they even senesce, meaning 
they stop dividing and sit around in the body and cause inflammation. Now, what Steve discovered was that if you use machine learning and look at the various marks that change with age in a human or in a mouse or even in a, in a, a bat, he sees that there are certain marks that change and certain ones that don't. And he can take a blood sample from, from anyone. I mean, he could take your blood if he hasn't already. And he could tell you when you're going to die within pretty, you know, within par certain parameters, a few years. And what's interesting about that is you can actually change the trajectory of that aging. You can be healthy. You can take uh, supplements that we think can slow it down. Um, maybe even some hormone treatments that may reverse it. Um, and we're working in my lab on ways to truly reset that clock and go back in time. But the Horvath clock is the first time that we can have a tool that unambiguously tells us if something is either slowing or accelerating the aging process. Mm -hmm. That's true. And then it takes the perspective of individuals to think, well, would I like to extend uh, my being? One thing I noticed was... Uh, a when you were talking about your mom and she had been smoking, she had a smoking habit. One line she said is something I've said that nobody's ever said. She said, I've lived a good life. The rest is a bonus. So in one way, I had said when I was like 22, 23, I've lived a full life. Anything else is a bonus. I never heard somebody else say that. So I thought that was interesting. Um, is it, is it, are the individuals that are going to support aging as a disease and clearance of it the ones that are in a good condition or the ones that are in like their last years of life and need some sort of thing like that? Uh, well, in my experience, people who mm. are healthy are the ones most excited about the research. What they understand is that this isn't about living a long time. It's about addressing medicine in a new way. If we, we spend how many billions of dollars per year in the US at least tackling cancer and heart disease and Alzheimer's disease. And don't get me wrong, I'm all for medical research. Um, I'm a medical researcher after all. But what I, I call that a whack-a-mole whack medicine, trying to just stop each disease. Now, that sounds great, but if you were to stop all cancer today across the planet, on average, lifespan would only go up by about two and a half years because all of the other causes of death are going up exponentially. And exponentially is hard to imagine, but it's a graph that starts like this and then goes two stories tall by the time you're 80. Um, and so everything's going up at once. And the only way to have a meaningful impact on people's healthy lifespan or their health span is to address the underlying cause of all of these diseases, and that's aging. Mm -hmm. One thing, you mentioned that in the book as well, the hospitals are set up to handle one condition at a time. Would they support any of this research or is there like a backlash against this kind of thing? Uh, you know, I, I think there's a backlash because it, aging is not thought of as a disease. When you're trained as a doctor, you're thought to, to treat diseases and aging never comes up. Uh, but in my book, I make uh, hopefully a strong case that, or I believe it's a strong case for aging being considered a medical condition. And the only difference between it and a typical disease is that it affects more than 50% of the population. And that to me doesn't count as, a, as an excuse to ignore this. Um, and a lot of people are, you, you mentioned, what about elderly? Are they excited about this? Yes and no. People who are sick often have given up. They think that there's nothing that can be done, which is not true. Um, but overall, if you don't think that there's a treatment, it's scary to even discuss doing something. Same way 100 years ago when we couldn't treat cancer or infections, you know, it would be crazy for someone to say, oh, we should stop all cancer. Well, that seemed pointless, but now we talk about it. The same way is going to happen with aging. Now that we have a handle on why we age and can even show not just slowing it down, but reversing it. Now the conversation seems more reasonable that it's not an if, it's a when this is going to be a medicine or many medicines. And when that happens, what's society going to be like? What are our lives going to be like? What's going to be good about the world and what's going to be bad about the world? Mm hmm. I like the example of with your dad that he was in a condition that he was somewhat limited and then after taking some supplements, he is now functioning, active, healthy. Has that been very nice to see from your position? Right. Well, uh, you know, I'm a scientist, so an experiment with one subject doesn't count as a clinical trial. Right. Or for that matter, proof of anything. 
but it, but it's a it's a beacon of he's a beacon of hope. He's a role model for what life could be like for millions, if not billions, of people. And if we're right, his lifestyle combined with the supplements that he's taken, based on research from my lab and some others, uh, is actually working. Now, what I've noticed, and he noticed as well, is that he is more active. He's feeling younger. He doesn't have any aches, pains, diseases um, at 80. Um, and at 70, he wasn't like that. He was fairly depressed and not not looking forward to the future. But now he started a new career. Uh, he's traveling around the world. We recently got back from Africa, hiking with uh, up the, the rainforest of Uganda to see gorillas. Now, you know, I can't say whether it's this supplement or it's his exercise, but what I can say is this is what life is about, being 80 years old, hiking up the mountains in Uganda with your grandkids and hopefully your great grandkids, passing on your wisdom. And for my kids, they were thinking this is what lifespan is about, being able to hike up the mountains with my grandfather, you know, and compare that to his mother who died or was basically in a wheelchair at 80. That's not a life you'd wish on anybody. And that's the difference we're talking about. Mm -hmm. One way I think about it is like maintaining high bandwidth connections for a longer time. Because I always think of life in terms of bandwidth as far as connectivity. So a fast internet connection or a slow one or people uh, in person versus over text or in limited capacity. And so increasing the bandwidth. Uh, one thing that came to mind was the survival circuits that are in us, are they in every single type of animal and or plant? Is there any organism that doesn't really have that? Or is it almost every organism? Uh, well, we haven't seen it in viruses, but I mm. wouldn't say never. But bacteria have survival circuits. They have sirtuins, the genes we work on in my lab, um, jellyfish, yeast. Uh, yeah, we, it's it's everywhere. These sirtuin genes and, and mTOR, which is one of the other survival circuit components, AMP kinase, these are some of the oldest genes uh, on the planet. And they sense the world around us. They sense how much meat we're eating. They're sensing the temperature. They're sensing blood glucose, so energy. And uh, they're sensing exercise. And they respond. When your body's threatened, they will fight back. And if you sit around and you eat a lot of food, they'll get lazy. They'll work instead on other things that are not helping longevity. Mm -hmm. I noticed that they're either repairing or they're going to help re fertility and reproduction. Um, you describe how the epigenome is like a DVD that's scratched or needs to be polished up and how sirtuins can do that. Can you explain a little bit about how they do that? Right. Well, so the, the sirtuins are what are called information regulators. Uh, the DNA, DNA in our cells, it's not just flailing around like a string. It's actually very nicely bundled up into uh, hose reels. You know, on your driveway, you wrap up the hose or it's looped out where it can be, the genes can be bred. And the pattern of loops and spools determines what type of cell you are. And the sirtuins are some of what we call epigenetic regulators or silencing proteins. And sirtuins regulate silent information. They're the ones that are involved in spooling the hose so that the genes are compacted and cannot be read. But what we found is that the sirtuins get distracted by other things that they need to do, like repair DNA. If you have an x-ray or you, you, your DNA breaks for another reason, sirtuins will leave that region where they're controlling those genes, keeping them off. They'll go away. Those genes will come on but then for the cell to go back to its original identity, it has to all be put back together again. And we think that that constant game of tennis of moving away, coming back, is the reason that we age. We lose that structure of our epigenome. And the analogy is uh, the information on the, the, the DVD is all still there. But this, this inability of the cell to read the information is like having sandpaper on the DVD. So now the cell cannot read the genes at the right time, at the right place, and the cells become dysfunctional. So what we've been looking for, for the last five years at least, is how do you polish the DVD so the cell can read that music again and get back to being young? Mm -hmm. Now, when the cells do uh, lose their ability to transmit information and they become useless but benign, senescent cells, they just accumulate, as you mentioned in the book, are older people an accumulation of loads of senescent cells? Like if you look at a seven-year-old person's body? Yeah, they are. There's not a lot. It's a, it's a small percentage of cells, but 
but they do accumulate as we get older and then they just sit there and they do two bad things uh, they're, they're putting out a lot of protein signals um, that inflame surrounding tissue uh, that will cause diseases uh, the second thing they do is they put out proteins that stimulate cell growth so if you have a tumor that's benign and sitting there the senescent cells could drive that tumor uh, to start growing and spread and uh, so the idea is that if we had chemicals that we could uh, pop or put into our joints or into our vein and kill off those cells you could be partially rejuvenated uh, and in mice that works and so there's some clinical trials now with senolytic molecules they're called seno and lytic meaning kill um, and the uh, next few years will tell us if they're actually going to work mm -hmm. an accumulation of just cells that are just sitting there now if a cell a set of cells is dead and or nerve cells that don't grow back I read a little bit in one of your chapters about how uh, you just recently were able to regrow nerve cells, the optic nerve. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because we always think of nerve cells being gone, yeah. gone forever. That's it. Yeah. Well, let, let's go back to the Horvath clock for a minute. Yes. Horvath clock is thought to be just a clock on the wall. It tells you how old you or what time it is or how old you are biologically. But nobody had thought that that clock was actually controlling time. You change the clock, it's not going to make you young again, right? That would be ridiculous. Uh, we, we disagree. We thought that if, if we move the clock backwards and restore the, the pattern of the methyl groups, and if we could get the sirtuin proteins that have been lost back to where they were when we were young, that could truly rejuvenate and set, send us back a decade or more. And so we looked and looked and we found a set of three genes that work safely. Um, we're standing on the shoulders of Juan Carlos Belmonte, who in 2016 showed that you could rejuvenate um, a, a short-lived mouse and make it live longer by putting in four different genes. We use three of those genes to reset the clock. And we can reset the clock in any part of the body. We chose the eye initially because, as you've said correctly, the eye after a certain young age doesn't regenerate. But we thought if we could wind the clock back in the eye, it might grow back, it might get functional again, and we could even repair a broken nerve. And we, we did that. We pinched off the nerve at the back of the eye, turned on three what are called Yamanaka factors, which we believe reprogram the clock to be young. And now those nerves started to regrow back, back to the brain. That was exciting, but we did something else that was exciting, even more exciting. We said if we're actually working on aging and reversing it, we should be able to take an old mouse that can't see because it's blind with its retina being old and make those nerves at the back of the eye young again and the mouse should see again. And we did it and it worked. Mice could see again. And uh, it wasn't just a fluke because we could read the genes in the back of the eye. The genes were going back to the, the youthful structures and we really did have the polish and the polish was working and the cell could read the genes again. It was brilliant. And we're starting to understand what's behind the clock, what's behind those hands that when we move them back, time actually goes backwards. One interesting part when I was thinking about that is that uh, where is the original information? You talked about that as far as the correction pathway. And if some of the information is scratched off, it's gone, right? But apparently it's able to come back to the original state which is sort of like, I like how you linked it to TCP IP for internet, the way that if you send internet packets, there's the check mechanism to come back. Okay, these packets are good. And we do this all the time ever since the internet has been going. Can you speak a little bit about what might be our correction response pathway? Yeah. So this is the big breakthrough uh, that we've had in the last uh, few years in my lab. And it's, it's all in, in the book, actually. It was great to write the book while we were making these discoveries last year. Uh, I hope you enjoyed being... It feels very paper. current. Yeah, it really is. The papers are just coming out in the scientific literature. You can find them online if anyone wants to Google my name. Uh, this paper we're talking about is on BioArchive, B-I-O-R-X-I-V. Um, yeah, so the what we found was that the, um, the reset program worked better than we thought, that it really went back to a young age. But it raises the, the question, where is that information held? So that remember, this Horvath clock is a bunch of chemicals 
called methyls on DNA. Now, if you were to turn a cell into a stem cell, which is what most people use these genes for, you'd strip all the methyl chemicals off. It would be like, instead of tuning a guitar, you'd rip the strings off. Now, we're not ripping the strings off. We're actually tuning the guitar. So we, the cell takes off this methyl, but leaves this one and adds one here. It's, it's as though the cell knows exactly how to play the symphony again and which, which scratches to remove, but not too deeply. Now, where that information is held, we don't know. Uh, we know it's there somewhere. We're looking. It could be at the level of chemicals on the DNA. It could be proteins that are involved in the wrapping. It could be sirtuins, these proteins we've worked on, these longevity genes. But that's the holy grail right now, is to find where's that information locked up so we can open it up. We know that some organisms can already do that. We know that if you cut the arm off an axolotl, a salamander, it'll grow back. We know if you mush up a jellyfish, it'll grow back. But we've lost that ability. But I think we're tapping into those ancient abilities now. Mm -hmm. It made me think of like if, if we were not so evolutionarily from thousands of years ago, crowdsourcing to get all the cells and then finding the ones that matched up would be the way that we could do it as like uh, machines. But obviously, maybe we don't have that. Maybe we do. I don't know. Maybe we have some link to but that'd be kind of a cool method to like say, oh, there's adenine here, adenine here. Okay, probably confirmed. Yeah, yeah, I thought about right. that. Uh, that's kind of cool. It's like a repair mechanism we've been using. The amount of stuff that's going on while we're just sitting here is an amazing thing. Now, you talked about the past, the present, and then also the future. You talk about some of the social dynamics related to uh, this research and what's coming in the next hundred years. I sometimes think about this. Two things. One, um, you mentioned all the things that are coming in the next decades that are all at the same time global warming and then uh like well, i don't know if artificial intelligence was mentioned but like that replacing us kind of and then this aging research thus negating ending of existence do these at the same time give you a feeling of like peace because sometimes when i read this kind of material i feel like peace like oh we should all be relaxed because everything is we can't take today seriously because 10 years from now today is going to look like comical in a way. Do you ever think about that? Well, that, that's what I'm, I hope people who read my book come away with, that, that this is a, a beacon of hope in a world that seems to be falling apart and totally chaotic. And, and I'm, I've given my prescription on how to get us to that, that future. And it involves not just putting more effort into slowing human diseases, but it will release trillions of dollars into the global economy that can be put towards answering other big problems and solving them, put money into education, put money into the developing world, into global warming, climate change. These are our biggest problems. And one of the reasons we are not able to work on these is that we don't have enough resources to go around. And if we didn't, what I would say, waste our money on medical care that could be prevented and squeezed into a shorter part of people's lives at the end, then that money could be put to a lot of other use. Plus, if you keep people healthy and productive and alive when they're 70 or 80, that's a lot of wisdom. Um, and the longer, live, longer people live, the more they care about the future as well. And that, that's another nice side effect of what would happen. Right. I've thought about that too. They're the ones who have the most experienced decades of this happened, this happened. They can see pattern, pattern recognition. What is, I was wondering, you're in the midst of it, what are some of the biggest demands on you at this time? Like, do they come from individuals or companies or where do you feel the biggest demand on what you are doing? Well, so my, my challenge is to not get distracted from the mission. Uh, my day is, is unusual. It's like an Elon Musk kind of world where things are flying around me, people coming in, asking me quick questions, emails come in constantly. Uh, and so it's it's not that I do one task at a time. I'm usually doing five things at once. Uh, and sometimes I pause for interviews. But usually it's, you know, I'm typing an email while listening to a meeting, while sending a text, that kind of stuff. I think we all do that. Um, that's what my world is like. Uh, I'm currently focused on a few things. I, I'm, I'm trying to get the word out that aging is a medical condition that we want to address. And the book is helping. I'm, you know, very pleased that the the book shot straight up to a New York Times bestseller and has stayed there. That's um, fantastic. And that's what I was hoping was changing the conversation, changing the way the world thinks about this problem. 
But I'm also very much grounded in the lab work. In the lab, I've got 40 people behind me who are working on solving uh, what I think is the biggest biological problem of all time. What is the clock? Where is the information stored? Where's the backup hard drive? And so I spend most of my time doing that. Uh, on the side, I'm shepherding uh, about a dozen companies working on different drugs, um, ranging from treatments for rare diseases all the way to treatments for obesity and diabetes. Uh, and those are in humans, some of them. Um, and so that's exciting as well. But what I do to, to be able to, to do all of this is to work with people that are the best at their game and I don't have to supervise them. What I can do is help guide them, but really that they're in charge. And if anyone's wondering how it's possible to do all of this, I'm really not doing it all. All I'm doing is bringing together smart people and putting them on hard problems. Mm -hmm. You want people who are already on go. It doesn't make sense to try to get somebody who's on pause to then be on go. That's just not effortful. Uh, One thing about the Horvath clot, can anybody do that? Like test to find out their... Yeah, you can. Uh, there's a, a couple of startup companies I've heard of that have done it. I haven't yet, but I'd like to. I'm working with Steve Horvath uh, potentially to to have one of these companies available. But anyway, look, I mean, the short answer is yes. It's not cheap yet. We're hoping to bring that down to $5 a test. Right now it's a, probably a few hundred dollars. But yeah, it's, a, it's available and it's really accurate. It's more accurate than anything. Um, there's another company that I've been using uh, and in full disclosure, I, I, I have some small investment in them. But if people are wondering, there's another one called Inside Tracker, which also uses blood biomarkers to estimate how you're doing compared to the rest of your your uh, colleagues. And uh, and that one's been useful for me as well as able to ostensibly bring my age down uh, whenever it went up too, too fast. Mm. This is a wonderful thing. I feel like it'll be the, it seems like a cooler 23 and me. More specific to, well, that one's more broad, but like a, I think people would, they would, you would see kids saying, well, I'm actually eight, but I was 12, but that'd yeah. be nice. Right, right. Uh, it's okay. a whole, you, whole you, what, new way to look at yourself and your life that mm-hmm. you, only 20% of your lifespan is genetic. The rest is what you do with your life. So you can, you can choose to live an extra 10 years if you want to. It's, it's all up to you. It's one thing I noticed a lot of the concepts that are, true with cells are true with like they say you know 80 percent of how you handle something in life is your response to it only 20 percent is what happens to you is the same thing that happens to the way cells it's like we're a representation of the cell in some big form yeah, exactly that's kind of cool. oh, right uh one last thing what is one message i always like to check this one message if you had a megaphone to all of humanity that, like a sentence that you would tell all of them that represents something you'd want them to know uh that this field of of longevity call it aging research, has gone far beyond what we had dreamed of only 10 years ago. And it's going so fast, it's making my head spin. Just a year ago, we didn't know there was a backup hard drive of youth. And now we know how to access it, at least in animals, and bring back their eyesight. The next few years is going to be incredible. There are companies that have drugs that are in clinical trials. And so it's just a a remarkable world we live in where uh, it's like we've just discovered how to fly like a hundred years ago, and we can already see that we're going to be building jumbo jets one day. Uh, and to me, that's that's an incredible time to be alive. And that biology, and this particular problem in biology, to me, is going to be the most exciting thing in this 21st century. This is wonderful. I like all the work that you are doing. I like the way you describe it, to share it with the public and represent your message. The book is enjoyable, lifespan. It makes you feel like it makes me feel like, because I'm very logical-minded and deconstructionist, like, and relaxed. You see a representation of what is coming, and that's nice. Glad to have had you on the show. It's great to be on. I mean, uh, appreciate it, and these were great questions. Thank you very much. And we are out.